Hi, there, smart drivers. Talking to you tonight about fuel economy, like using less fuel. Or as one of my smart drivers said, it looked like useless fuel on the thumbnail that I put up for the live stream. But we're going to show you how to get the best fuel mileage out of your vehicle because of the cost of fuel, which is crazy expensive right now. And, you know, there are certain things that we need to blame in the world, but we don't know for sure why the cost of fuel is so expensive. But I'm a little afraid that the cost of fuel is not going to come down. So that's what we're talking about tonight, how to get better fuel economy. Evan is here. Mallory is here. Hello. Boy is here from Hawaii, and Rick is tuning in from New York, New York State, or New York City, my friend. Uh, Corey is here. Corey is the moderator, Bricks for Wheels. He does an excellent job of getting up the videos that I suggest you have a look at for more details on the answers that I give you for the questions you ask about getting a driver's license, getting working towards your driver's license, preparing for your driver's license, or becoming a safer, smarter driver or working towards your CDL license to start a career as a truck or bus driver. Ben is here, hello, Tyler, my friend. Uh, Joe is here from Toronto, hot and muggy Toronto. Yes, welcome to summertime in Ontario, Canada. Uh, my friend Sean is here from Minnesota and Tim is here from Drive Smart BC. If you're in the province of British Columbia and wanna know anything about traffic safety, policing, case law, uh, black letter law, uh, driving instruction, check out uh, Drive Smart BC over there and check out the information that Tim has as well. He has an excellent forum uh, that you can have discussions with other people in the industry and talk to them, which is really great. My friend Presto is here and I did read your comment yesterday, Presto, from two years ago. Uh, I was trying to take the day off yesterday and not really look at social media. I try and unplug at least one day a week. So I did see it. Welcome back, my friend. We're so glad you're here. Uh, Tyler says, when driving my car, I get 11.8 liters per 100 kilometers uh, in the city and 9 liters per 100 in the highway. Uh, that's not too bad for an older vehicle. Uh, some of the newer vehicles are getting a lot better fuel economy than that, for sure. Uh, Francisco is here from California, uh, retired 2019. Uh, Gary in North Carolina, hello, lots of people here tonight. And Corey's put up the link for Drive Smart BC if you want to check that out. Uh, Tim says his Tacoma gets about 10.2 liters per hundred. And that's about the same as what the buggy gets, the old CRV. And 10.2 is about 22 miles per gallon for those of you in the United States. Uh, you are most welcome, my friend Tim. Amberly Davis, hello, how are you? And... Some of the newer vehicles are going to get 40 miles per gallon. We're talking U.S. gallons. Uh, some of the new Volkswagens, with the 1.8 turbos, the Hondas are going to get those that kind of fuel mileage. Uh, Rain Craces uh, gets 36 miles per gallon uh, with his 92 Honda Civic. That's respectable in terms of a 1992 Honda Civic. I was just watching a video. He had a Honda Civic. He said he was getting 40 miles per gallon. He had a... Did he say 1.7? I think it was a 1.7 liter turbo. Uh, most of these newer vehicles are going to get that kind of fuel economy because that's what they're designed for and their cars as well. As well, it was a manual transmission. So if uh, you want to get better fuel economy, learn to drive a manual transmission. I know that probably sounds a bit weird and you're going to say, oh, automatics get the same fuel mileage. The truth is, is they don't. It's been marketed that automatic transmissions, you're, you're dealing with a hydraulic pump. That is the bridge between the engine and the drivetrain, and you're going to lose <laughs> some of the energy in that hydraulic pump. It's not a direct drive like it is in a clutch assembly, so know that. Uh, Tim says his CRV, and I think you're, you said your CRV was a 2010, did you not? 8.9 liters to the 100, which is good again. Uh, Ben uh, retired my Mazda CX-5 2020 is a 350 miles on a full tank. And, okay, we would need to know how many gallons are in that 2019 to know whether you got decent fuel mileage or not. Uh, Rain Cray says his is, a, is an automatic. Uh, and most of them in North America are going to be automatics. So, the uh, next thing, uh, Rain Cray said you got 38 on the highway. Uh, yeah, my... Tracy had a Volkswagen with a 1.8 turbo in it. We got 42 miles to the gallon in that going to Calgary on the highway, and so, which is 5.5 liters to the 100. Uh, one way we got 6.5, which is about 38. 
coming back the other way we've got 5.5 liters which is 42 miles to the gallon so some of these smaller cars are doing exceptionally well and the Volkswagen was also a six-speed uh, manual transmission and that thing you got it into second gear and that thing would haul <laughs> so you didn't really lose the power as well and I mean that's it's not like you know when we had the OPEC oil crisis in the early 1970s and everybody was looking around for small cars and you had the Datsuns <laughs> and the Civics and they had these little four-cylinder engines in them which had about a hundred horsepower and they had absolutely no power whatsoever uh, today we now have these smaller engines, these 1.8 liter engines, uh, small four cylinder engines that have turbochargers on them. And these things haul because the cars are not that big. So you have the horsepower to weight ratio as well. So you're not compromising on the fuel mileage uh, with the vehicle. But I'm gonna give you some information here about how to get actually better fuel economy with your current vehicle and see whether that works for you as well. Uh, Presto, my 2015 uh, Genesis sedan, 3.8 is rated for like 19 city. I average like 15 because I drive and stop and go traffic. And yes, city driving is the worst fuel economy you're going to get. And the reason for that, as I'm going to talk about in the presentation here, is that the brake. <laughs> as soon as you put your foot on that brake pedal, you're using fuel because you have to get it started again from a dead stop. And that's why fuel economy is so much lower, usually... 60% uh, of what you will get out on the highway is because you're getting the vehicle going all the time and that's when you use the most amount of fuel. Tyler, uh, when I test the fuel economy, I do math calculations, how many miles I drove and how many gallons the gas pump says. Yes, and usually a good idea is to keep your, your fuel receipts, how much fuel you put in the vehicle and then keep track of your mileage as well and how many miles you put on your vehicle between, you know, and how much fuel you put in it, and that's how you discover it. And there's, there are lots of uh, fuel mileage calculators here online you can just type that in and then we can go and then you can figure out what your fuel economy is usually you want to go from fill up to fill up to keep track of the fuel economy on your car uh, Ben says how about some makeup uh, goose is here from nickel city driving hello my friend how are you and Ben says sometimes why do people do that to other drivers that so rude to not let people in on the freeway that's my new pet peeve for driving in the Twin Cities uh, yeah it happens unfortunately Ben so let's talk about that. Uh, smart drive test, head over to the smart drive test website, pass your driver's test first time. It's on sale right now with the Memorial Day sale. Uh, I think you can pick it up for about 26 bucks. Pass your road test first time guaranteed. As well, we throw in both the winter and defensive driving smart courses. Uh, other piece of news that we need to get out of the way is I'm going to Spain on Thursday. I'm going to try and do the live stream next week. I'm not really certain what the internet is going to be like when I'm in Spain as well. <laughs> I love you guys. I really, really do love you. But I don't love you enough to get up at 3 a.m. to do 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So the live stream, if I do it next Sunday, will probably be 1 or 2 o'clock, which will be 9 o'clock in the evening, uh, Barcelona time. So... Uh, I am going to try and do a live stream from Spain. I'm going to do a bunch of videos as well to show you. And because my goal with going to Spain is to test my defensive driving theory. Because smart drivers and other people and feedback I get here on social media is that, oh, you come to Chicago and drivers don't drive like that. It's completely different. You go to Rhode Island, you go to Providence, and it's completely different. You come here to San Antonio, it's completely different. People drive different here. So <laughs> my hypothesis is that my defensive driving model is going to work in Spain. And so we're driving from Barcelona to Valencia, and then we're going to drive over to Madrid, and we're coming back. So that's down the coast to Valencia and then across to Madrid for those of you who don't know it's kind of a corner of a triangle and uh, I'm gonna see whether it works or not and we're gonna do some videos to prove whether scope 3 actually works and actually scope 3 which I'm gonna talk about in the presentation here will help you out with your fuel economy as well uh, rain craze I bet smart drive Rick has the smart dri smartest drivers on the street uh, we certainly hope so for sure thank you rain crazed uh, Charles, uh, is driving lessons four or five days a week a good idea and second two or more shoulder checks okay as well? Yes, definitely two shoulder checks every time you're going to change direction of the vehicle. I don't know whether I would go for one 
driving lesson every day for five days in a row, I would probably suggest you do one every other day and then you've got a day in there between two practice because driving lessons aren't designed to teach you how to drive completely. They're designed that you take a driving lesson and then you go off and practice and do some of the practice and learn the uh, techniques and skills that you were taught during your driving lesson and then go back and do another driving lesson. So that's what you need to do for the purposes of taking driving lessons. Uh, Rain Christ, I'm still a new driver. I studied hardcore with Rick and gotten my permit. Now I have my license. Uh, Tyler says his car is a 55 liter tank. Most of them do have 55 liter tanks. Tyler, the one in the buggy is 58 liters. So yeah, that makes sense. Kawai, got my five cl uh, class five license a little over a year ago and your channel helped me. Thank you so much. And thank you so much. And how has the driving been going in the last year there, my friend? That's really great. My friend Jake is here. Uh, JFSA 380, good evening, sir. Did the calculation math burn $500 per shift? Aren't company cards great? <laughs> so he drives truck and when he's talking about $500, $500 of diesel fuel per truck shift. So this is how much uh, fuel these things are getting. Uh, correct me on this, but I think trucks get like 30 liters per hundred. It's just terrible fuel economy. I've never seen a truck that got better than 6.8 miles to the gallon. These big tractor trailers, road tractors. So they, they take a lot of fuel. Uh, Clement, I'm glad I found your channel. It has helped me a lot. Thank you so much for your lessons and you are most welcome, my friend. All right, so let's get over to the PowerPoint presentation. We'll come back a little bit more and talk more about Spain. <laughs> I'm very excited to go to Spain and drive around Spain and do some lessons. Uh, Presto says his car gets 20.9, uh, is 20, holds 20 gallons, almost 21 gallons. All right, so using less fuel. Let's talk about that tonight, to get better fuel economy on your vehicle. And one of the things I'm not going to tell you is I'm not going to tell you to pump up and have proper tire pressure in your tires uh, because most of the newer vehicles all have uh, tire pressure monitors and you'll know whether the tires are full or not. So that's what's going to happen. Uh, <laughs> exactly what Tim just says. Uh, two critical words to, to better fuel economy are smooth and steady. And that's exactly what I'm going to talk about here. For those of you new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. I was a truck driver in the 1990s hauling freight between Canada and the United States, mostly Ontario, Canada, Quebec, and into the United States, east of the Mississippi. Most of what I ran was the Eastern Seaboard. I did make it out to the Western States a few times, uh, but mostly Florida, the Carolinas, uh, Arkansas, Ohio, the Midwest, and whatnot. Uh, became a licensed commercial driving instructor in 1997 to come off the road. Uh, and went back to university to finish my degree in the early 2000s. I graduated in 2006 from the University of Melbourne with my degree in legal history, which is the study of policing courts and prisons, which many of you may know, and my expertise is in policing as it relates to traffic. While I was going to university, I drove buses for Greyhound and one of the regional bus lines in Australia. And in 2015, I started the online business with the YouTube channel and the online website and it's been doing exceptionally well and on Friday we're launching a podcast. Uh, first episode goes out at 9 a.m. on Friday and uh, so looking forward to that. We're just growing it more and more and if you want to check out more about me you can check out the autobiography over at the Smart Drive Test website. Uh, this week the new video was parallel parking in traffic with other traffic behind you, communicating effectively, using your signal, putting your reverse lights on as soon as you stop, and having other traffic wait for you to parallel park. This is not a video for your, the purposes of your driver's test because most of the time driving examiners are not going to get you to parallel park in traffic. They're going to get you to do it on a quiet kind of residential road. This is actually in busy traffic in the city. Uh, that's what I was doing and helping you out with. Okay, the first thing that kills your fuel mileage is idling. This is going to cut into some of your creature comforts because this is one of the biggest pet peeves that I have in the winter time. You no longer have to start your vehicle and idle it for 10 minutes. Start it up as long as it takes you to clean the snow and ice off your vehicle is as long as it needs to idle. And now they have vehicles, mostly the Fords that I've seen, that will shut down uh, as soon as they sit for a couple of seconds. They will turn the engine off to try and uh, reduce the amount of fuel consumed in them. So uh, I would be interested to hear about that because I haven't driven one of those yet. 
uh, that has the engine shut off. Uh, it's my understanding that some of the European countries had a law that if you are the fourth person in a line at a traffic light that is red, uh, it was law that you had to shut off your vehicle. There are all kinds of idling laws in the state of California. California is the leader on pollution. So turn it off. If you have one of those stupid remote car starters, resist the urge to use that dumb thing because those are the worst. Uh, the other piece about idling is drive throughs <laughs> the number of people that I see sitting in drive throughs with their car idling away. And I think, you know, my kids, my kids said this to me last week. My daughter was going on about plastic straws and they're not environmental and this and that. And then the conversation turned to why I never go into drive throughs I just park and go in and get whatever I want out of the restaurant. And my daughter, I, I looked at her and I said, you were, you were just, honey, you were just giving me a half an hour lesson on the detriment to our environment because of plastic straws. And I said, now you're not making the connection with environmentalism and cars sitting in a drive-thru and idling. So <laughs> why don't we just park our cars, turn the engine off and go into the restaurant and get what we need. So turn it off. And big trucks are the worst. And I don't know what it is about big trucks. For whatever reason, we cannot get commercial drivers to turn their trucks off. And most of these now, there's no reason for them to be sitting there idling. All right. Tune-ups. When was the last time that your vehicle had a tune-up? When was the time, last time the oil was changed? When was the last time that the fuel and air filters were changed? The spark plugs, the wires. All of this is going to undermine your fuel economy. The tires, if you have irregular wear, the tire has to work more, or the vehicle has, the engine has to work harder to get the vehicle up and down the road. So if you haven't had a tune-up on your vehicle, and yes, it might cost you two or three hundred bucks to get your vehicle into the shop, but now you're going to get better fuel economy a mile per gallon think about how much that's going to add up over a period of time uh, with your vehicle when you're going up and down the road it's going it's going to pay itself in dividends okay junk in your car excess weight in your vehicle if you've got a whole bunch of crap in your vehicle figure out what needs to be in there what doesn't need to be in your vehicle and get it out the other piece about all of this crap in your vehicle is it doesn't feel comfortable to your to drive your vehicle you don't feel safe with all that crap in your vehicle get it out get your vehicle clean your vehicle is going to get be safer it's going to be lighter and it's not going to consume the same amount of fuel manage space and we've talked about this and tim just said this from Dr smart drive bc smooth and steady if you create more space around your vehicle you're going to use the brake less you're going to have to use you're going to use less fuel to get the vehicle going because as I said the vehicle uses the, uses the most amount of fuel from a dead stop so if you can anticipate the traffic lights keep the vehicle going play the game go green get the vehicle go to green and just roll up to the light and use the throttle to control the vehicle speed you are going to get better fuel economy because as you know most vehicles are rated city mileage and highway driving and in the city they're going to get less fuel economy because of stop and go traffic so you want to anticipate the traffic read the traffic patterns and get keep the vehicle going so you want to be looking farther down the road you want to be interpreting the movements of other vehicles you want to be paying attention to your driving and you want to have patience and if you're sitting in this kind of traffic and you're sitting in a traffic light then turn your vehicle off uh, put it into neutral. Most of you are going to be driving automatic transmissions. You can just dump it into neutral. You can have the key to the on position. It's ready to go. Watching traffic, watching the traffic light. And then as soon as the traffic light is about to turn to green, you just fire the vehicle back up and away you go. Dump it into gear and away you go. Okay, so paying attention to your driving and having patience. All right. The other piece with all of this, for most of us, we live in cities. We do not live out in the country. We are not uh distance isn't forcing us to have to drive every day into work or in to get groceries or those types of things but if you are and you want to drive your vehicle combine your trips figure out yes i need to go and get water for the water cool cooler i need to go to the butcher shop i need to go to the grocery store make one big trip where you're doing all of your shopping at the same time and you're going to all of these different places whereas instead of Oh, I got to go to the butcher. So you go out to the butcher, you come back home. Oh, I forgot to go, got to go and get water. So a bit more planning in terms of 
your trips with your vehicle is going to consume less fuel as well. And then alternative forms of transportation. You don't always have to take your car. And for me, I don't always take my car. I, a lot of times I will walk or I will take my bicycle. I have panniers on my bicycle. I have a carrier. You know, I can carry stuff. If I just need to run down to the shop to get a jug of milk, then I'll either walk down to the shop with my backpack or I will take my bicycle and I'll throw it in one of my bags or you can take public transportation. Many of these large urban centers, New York, Los Angeles, Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, they have excellent uh, public transportation. The seven years that I lived in Melbourne, Australia, I never had a car because I either rode my bicycle or I took public transit. I never even looked at a schedule any time that I ever got on a, a, a public transit in the city of Melbourne because the trams came every eight minutes. So you never had to look at a schedule. And the other piece about living in Australia was if I did need a car, I either borrowed a car or I went and hired a car. Just rented a car instead of actually having one sitting in the driveway that I only used every now and again. So alternative forms of transportation, going with someone else, taking the bus, taking your bicycle. Okay, highway driving. And this is interesting because I was just watching this video that somebody sent to me about fuel economy. They were talking about their brand new Honda Civic that they were getting 40 miles to the gallon. And they were showing you how to improve fuel economy out on the highway. And he gets on the highway and doesn't put it on cruise control. Modern electronic engines are designed to be run on cruise control on the highway. I cannot stress that enough. They are engineered. They have been engineered that way for 30 years. And I know that there are 70% of people who drive cars who do not use cruise control. And they say to me, I'm, I don't feel like I'm in control. Well, you're not a very good driver then. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that again. If you can't learn how to use cruise control, you can't teach yourself how to use cruise control and learn how to cancel it and hit resume, you're not a very good driver. And it's not that you don't feel like you're in control. It's the fact that you're lazy and won't learn how to do something. So learn how to use cruise control to get better fuel economy on your vehicle. Cruise control on the highway will improve your fuel economy by at least 20%. So learn how to use it. It's really not that hard. And there are, there's a video here on the channel that will teach you how to use cruise control. And almost every vehicle manufactured today has cruise control on it. And they are specifically designed to run on cruise control on the highway. Okay, stay out of the clusters on the uh, roadway. And as well, your towing trailers, you have, car you have cargo carriers on the top of your vehicle, you have roof racks, all of those create extra wind drag on your vehicle and they're going to compromise and erode your fuel economy on your vehicle. So if you're not, you don't have anything on your cargo carrier, take it off the top of the car, take the roof racks off the car because they are going to compromise fuel economy on your vehicle. Try and keep as much of the stuff inside the vehicle, not on the outside hanging off of it and whatnot. Okay, Memorial Day sale, pass your driver's test first time over at the Smart Drive Test website. Have a look at that if you want to pass your uh, driver's test first time guaranteed. As a bonus, we throw in both the winter and defensive driving smart courses. Good luck in your driver's test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. And heading back over here. There we go. Uh, ben, I love cruise control. I love cruise control. It's so easy to use. I know how to use it. Excellent. Uh, Jake, uh, depends on the company, some offer waivers, but you may be able to put on your own policy. Okay, excellent. Uh, Mallory, if you have to be somewhere at a certain time, just leave earlier so that you're not in a hurry to get there. Yes, that's something that some people don't do is plan their trips very well. Uh, Tyler, a Viper got 48 liters per 100 kilometers and that's driving normal. It has an 8.3 liter V10, 48 liters per 100. Oh, that's pretty terrible. <laughs> uh, presto, I wouldn't stop the engine at stoplights on a normal car. I would, however, if I was going to be stopped for more than a few minutes, like waiting for a long train. Uh, presto, I stop my, I stop the old buggy all the time. If I'm sitting at a light that I know is long, I'll just turn the engine off because most, most traffic lights are going to be a couple of minutes, uh, you know, at bigger intersections. So if I'm third or fourth in line, I just shut the car off and then you can see the traffic coming through the intersection. And like I said, I have it in neutral. I have the key to the on position, just fire the engine up because 
electronic uh, fuel injected engines are going to fire right up and you just stick it in gear and away you go. Uh, Angel says, I wish my cruise control worked. <laughs> yes, that's the other part too, is a lot of times the cruise control simply doesn't work. Uh, Presto says, I, okay, we already said that one. Uh, Presto, I love the cruise control on my cars. It's adaptive and slows down for me. And yes, that's the other piece about cruise control on newer vehicles is it's going to be adaptive cruise control, uh, which you can set for a following distance to the traffic in front of you. Now, I don't really like it personally because most of the time I'm very engaged in what's going on with the driving. And when I come up on another vehicle, I'm timing the vehicle kind of coming up beside me and I just want to move out and move around the vehicle. I find with the adaptive cr cruise control, as soon as the sensors get a hold of that vehicle in front, it cuts the power and then it's got to accelerate again. So it defeats the benefit of that constant speed with the vehicle where you're going to get your your highest fuel economy. So, you know, you kind of got to plan that with your adaptive cruise control. I guess you can set it at two seconds, three seconds, or a four second following distance. And if you set it at a smaller, uh, uh, a smaller distance from the vehicles in front, you're, you're gonna get a lot closer before it's actually gonna cut the speed on your vehicle. So it's, you know, it's one of those things you kind of got to get used to for sure. Absolutely. Uh, Rain craze. Mine, cra mine is not electric and I don't have cruise control. Mine uh, don't have it. Uh, 1992 Honda Civic. I just have it my catalog on the speed and mirrors blind spots. Uh, 1992 Honda Civic. Okay, so that, yeah, that's a good possibility that you don't have cruise control on that for sure. Corey's put up the video on how to use cruise control. And... Uh, Jake was saying that uh, his truck gets high 20s to like 26, 27 liters per hundred on the newer trucks. And uh, <laughs> that's just crazy fuel economy when you think about that. Uh, ben says, I also plan trips right down to the alternate route just in case there's traffic or road construction. Uh, it is road construction season for sure. And that's another place when you're stopped in traffic waiting for construction to proceed, then you want to, you know, turn the vehicle off until the flagger's ready to go. Especially if you're a couple of cars back and you have the ignition to the on position and you have the it in neutral. It's just a matter of firing up the engine, slapping the stick back into drive, and away you go, right? Uh, Royal Rooster, I set the cruise to a few miles below the limit. Today I averaged 31 miles per gallon over 120 miles in my 2012 RAV4. And 31 miles per gallon in a in a 10 year old RAV4, that is fantastic fuel economy uh, on that vehicle. And uh, Ruder, what, uh, how fast were you traveling? Were you doing 55, 60 miles an hour uh, for that kind of fuel economy? Because that, that is really good fuel economy. Uh, Tyler, cruise control was optional on my car, thanks. The previous owner got it and my car doesn't have ABS, it was optional. Uh, that's interesting that ABS was optional because on most new vehicles, uh, ABS is not an option. It's something that's pretty standard uh, with most newer vehicles now. Uh, Peachy, what about waiting on a train at a crossing? Uh, Peachy, same thing. Yeah, you can shut the vehicle off. And the other thing you can do, especially with a train, depending on, I mean, obviously, if it's a passenger train, it's not going to be as many cars. But if it is a freight train and it's 100 cars, then definitely, yeah, you can shut the vehicle off, put it in a neutral, apply the parking brake, and then wait. You know, you're looking down the track, you're waiting for the end of the train. As soon as you see the end of the train, you know, disengage, put your foot on the foot brake, disengage the parking brake, fire up the engine and throw it into gear, and, and you're ready to go, okay? Uh, Presto, still adaptive cruise control is a cool party trick to show your friends with your car sh slowing itself down combined with uh, lane assist. Uh, steering wheel, yes. <laughs> uh, and I've talked to people who have adaptive cruise control and lane assist on their vehicle and it is almost like a Tesla in terms of going up and down the highway. They will almost drive themselves and you have very little uh, in terms of being engaged in the actual, excuse me, driving of the vehicle. Uh, it's, it's pretty incredible. Uh, Ruder, I was going approximately 60 miles an hour on mostly highway, roughly a hundred of those miles were highway and there you go. So, you know, you're not going any slower. This is, this is the thing that I want to impress upon you. And the, the piece that Ruder just said is you don't have to go slower. This isn't what this is about. You don't have to drive 55 miles an hour. That's not what I'm saying. 
I'm saying that you need to keep the vehicle going and the more constant you can keep the speed of your vehicle, the better fuel economy you're going to get. There are things that are going to erode fuel economy. Idling is going to erode fuel economy. Having stuff hanging off your vehicle, cargo carriers, roof racks, those types of things are going to erode fuel economy. Too much weight in the vehicle is going to erode fuel economy. Poorly tuned engines are not going to get the same type of fuel economy. So know all of that and know as well, if you're driving on the highway, learn how to use cruise control because electronic, uh, electronic fuel injected engines are designed to run on, on computers or to run on cruise control and have the computer monitor all the functions of the engine. And there is no way that modern engines, you cannot keep a steady pace uh, on the throttle with your foot on the gas pedal. We just can't, we cannot match cruise control in terms of being able to keep that steady speed on your vehicle. Uh, presto, except in Texas where we have 75 mile an hour speed limits and we start to have drag and lose a bit of fuel economy. Of course, yes, once you're up around the 75 miles per hour, 80 miles per hour, of course, it takes a lot more to push that vehicle through the wind stream. So yes, you're gonna start losing fuel economy at those kinds of speeds and whatnot. But still, you wanna keep that constant steady speed and that's going to improve your fuel economy overall. Uh, Corey, feeling a little spicy today about the general dismissal of cruise control, eh? I do definitely agree though, love cruise control. <laughs> yes, I got a little enthusiastic about cruise control. What can I say? Because I think that people should learn how to drive their car instead of, you know, just going, oh, this is how it's done. This is how my grandpa did it. This is how his great grandpa did it. Yeah, no, your great grandpa didn't drive cars. He rode horses and he didn't ride horses. He walked because horses were for rich people. So learn how to drive your vehicle. Learn how to put it on cruise control on the highway to get better fuel economy. Yes. Okay. Uh, truth, I passed my class five last month. Thanks so much for your videos and help trying to stay a safe driver long term. Would love videos for experienced drivers as well in the future. And yes, truth, have a look. Corey will put the video up for you on five defensive driving tips that will help you out in terms of keeping yourself safe. And that will go back to managing space around your vehicle. And as I said, in terms of fuel economy, using the brake is going to undermine your fuel economy. It's going to cut your fuel economy. So if you can manage space and just use the throttle to control that space, you are gonna get, you're gonna be a safer, smarter driver and you're gonna get better fuel economy in your vehicle. The only times that you should be using the brake on your vehicle is when you're slowing to come to a stop, slowing behind other traffic that's turning or slowing down for some unexpected reason, uh, controlling your speed on a downhill or unexpected events. Those are the only four times that you should be using the brake. If you're just driving through town in a straight line and you've got all green lights, you should just be using the throttle to control your space in front of your vehicle. Yes, I can say that three to four second following distance where the vehicle in front goes past a fixed object and you start counting, you know, one watermelon, two watermelons, three watermelons, and now you have a three second following distance. Nobody does that. So know that if you are using the fuel pedal to control space in front of your vehicle by simply letting off the throttle and accelerating, then you're doing the right thing in terms of defensive driving. And the benefit of better defensive driving and managing space well around your vehicle is that you're getting better fuel economy. And I had a driver say to me, leave a comment this afternoon that when somebody leaves space in front of the vehicle and people cut in, they, they hit the brakes. If you're, if you're hitting the brakes, you're not doing it right. You should have enough space that you just let off the throttle, reclaim your space, and then re resume driving again. You shouldn't, because if you're, if you're, if the person's cutting in front of you and you've got to hit the brakes, you're not managing space well because you're too close to the vehicle in front of you when that other vehicle cuts in front of you. You need to be back farther. So when that person does take that space, you just let off the throttle and then regain your space in front of your vehicle again and you're gonna be a safer, smarter driver and get better fuel economy. If you're a safer driver and have better space around your vehicle, the end result is both safer, smarter and better fuel economy. What, Tim, what Going back to what Tim said earlier about steady and smooth. And that's what you want for, and it has two benefits. 
Uh, Tyler also got my power steering rack replaced. It now handles way better. <laughs> I, I bet it does, Tyler, <laughs> now that you have that fixed for sure. Uh, 44, shouldn't you use your brake while reversing? Uh, yes, absolutely reversing because, of course, you're coming to a stop. So you're correct on that for sure. Absolutely. Thank you for that correction. Uh, ben, I always have good space management when I drive. I'm a very good defensive driver. Awesome. Uh, Peachy, when I first learned to drive, I used to hover my foot over the accelerator to teach me the feel of how to keep a constant speed. And that is really good because obviously you have to learn how to do that for the purposes of your driver's test. Uh, Mallory, my mom is using cruise control on the highway never when it's raining or snowing. Uh, that's, that's not so much true anymore. If it's raining a lot, then absolutely don't use cruise control. But if it's just raining steady, you can use cruise control in the rain on the highway because all vehicles, not all vehicles, most vehicles are now are four wheel drive, all wheel drive, or they have stability control in them. So it's not the same issue that it once was. The other piece, if you have good tires on your vehicle, you're not the, the chances of hydroplaning are minimal. In the old days, with old bias ply tires and bald tires, it was dangerous to drive in the rain. That's not the case anymore. We have better tires. We have radial tires. We have stability control. We have better suspensions on vehicles and better technology overall. So you can use cruise control when it's raining. As I said, if it's raining excessively and the water is pooling on the roadway, then absolutely don't use cruise control. Uh, winter time, most of the time in the winter, the roads are clear. Uh, even if it's hard pack, as we get here in the mountains, for those of you who don't know what hard pack is, is when you get so much snow on the roads that the snow plows can't just clear it off anymore, it just becomes ice. Even on that, as long as you're staying in a straight line and you know how to cancel your cruise control, and this is the other piece about using and learning how to uh, learning how to and to use your cruise control, is make sure you know where the cancel button is so you can cancel it immediately, right? You can always touch the brake, but it's better if you hit the cancel button. It's the same thing with the buggy. I like the buggy because it's manual transmission. And for me to disengage the cruise control, I just tap the clutch. As soon as I tap the clutch, it disengages the cruise control on the buggy. So I do like that. Uh, on Tracy's Audi, you just push the cruise control just away from you. You just like, just touch it and it automatically cancels the cruise control. So learn how to cancel the cruise control. So when you you know are judging your space and you're gaining on another vehicle and you need to cancel, you can just cancel it. You pull out around them and you hit resume again and away it goes again. So learn how to use your cruise control. My friend Sam is here. Hello, hello my friend. Uh, Rain craze, best to look at speed and all the signs. Yes. Uh, presto, car and cruise control will shut off automatically in most vehicles if stability control has to intervene in wet conditions. Okay, Presto, I did not know that. So there you go, uh, that uh, the stability control will cancel your cruise control. So another safety feature, because what happens is if the stability control intervenes and disengages the cruise control, the vehicle automatically slows down and you get traction again. That's the reason for that. Uh, Tyler, I'm moving to a small town that the speed is 40 kilometers an hour in the city and school zones from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Seven days a week, 365. Where where do you have school zones 365 days a year? We were talking about this last week that school zones only apply when school is in session. So I'd be interested to uh, know where that is. Uh, Peachy, sorry, I hovered my foot over the accelerator using cruise control. Okay, excellent. Uh, Joe, I can't imagine long trips without cruise control. Do that on I-80 out of North uh, Platt and your foot will run numb by Omaha. <laughs> uh, Joe, I hear you. I drove a couple of trucks in the 1990s that the cruise control didn't work on them and holding that fuel pedal down for eight hours was just like your foot was just about ready to fall off and uh, no thank you. <laughs> I will not drive a vehicle that doesn't have cruise control. Period. Just, I won't. So, uh, Peachy Cruise Control taught me how to ease off when you're near the top of hills. Yes. Uh, Tim says, using cruise control, read about it in your owner's manual. Do what the manufacturer says. Yes, absolutely. And, uh, you know, there's slight variations. Some of them are right on the face of the steering wheel. 
the one on the Audi is kind of buried up underneath the steering wheel. I don't really like the positioning of it as well. I don't find it as accessible. Might be something to do with the fact that it's actually a sports car. Uh, the one on the buggy is right on the steering wheel. And as I said, it's easy to cancel. You just tap the clutch and it just disengages. So it's very easy to use on the buggy. And it basically just has, you know, uh, set and resume. And then with the, with the set button, you can just hit it a couple of times and it'll accelerate. Uh, so I don't know whether you know that, but watch the video on it and you can learn how to, you know, set it a couple of miles an hour or, or drop it a couple of miles and th those types of things. Uh, Mallory, can you use your cruise control too much? Uh, not on the highways, no, but um, you can uh, cruise control. I wouldn't recommend using it in the city. I mean, unless you have a long stretch where, you know, you, you don't have a whole lot of lights and those types of things. Uh, ben, how do you start a new car with an electric start? Uh, are you talking about, Ben, are you talking about electric starter? Or are you talking about a new vehicle with uh, a, an electric motor? Is that what you're talking about? Are you talking about an electric car? Is that what you're talking about? Uh, Tyler, Saskatchewan school zones. Uh, Tyler, I hadn't heard that about Saskatchewan, so I don't know whether that's true or not. I would need to look into that for you. Uh, okay. Uh, 44, do you read all the road signs when driving? Uh, you want to take note of the road signs, not necessarily read them, but you do want to take note of them because that's going to help you drive, especially if you're in places that are unfamiliar. Uh, it will also make you a safer, smarter driver by reading the road signs because you know that road signs aren't, the road is not going to try and trick you, especially if you're reading the road signs. So yes, read the road signs. Some are more important than others, uh, but definitely the regulatory signs, know what those are, know what the cautionary signs are, uh, uh, suggested speed limits and those types of things. So have a look at all of that. Uh, Joe, when I live in, lived in Vancouver, I hardly ever drove except company cars for work. Uh, they've got a great transit system there. Uh, serious savings in gas costs, that is for sure. Absolutely, because the transit pass is, is way cheaper than owning a car and putting fuel in it, for sure. Uh, John, uh, Rick, please remember brake maintenance, lubrication, brake slides, parking brake adjustments, uh, wheel bearings and tires with high rolling resistance. Yes, all of that is going to save you fuel as well with proper maintenance of your suspension and bearings. And uh, of course, some of the domestic vehicles have to be greased on the front ends and whatnot. So know all of that. Uh, Tim, my friend, have a great night. Enjoy your dinner. All the best. And uh, we'll definitely get the time posted for next week because as I said, I'm going to be in Spain and they are nine, hour, nine hours ahead. So 6 p.m. PST Pacific Standard Time is three o'clock in the morning. And as I said, I love you. I love all of you. I really do, but I don't love you enough to get up at 3 a.m. and do a live stream. <laughs> Although, because of jet lag, I might be up at 3 a.m., so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> uh, Scarlett, those guys running BC love those carbon taxes and want to get an electric vehicle. Uh, let's not even talk about electric vehicles because they are not the solution to better, to less carbon in our environment. You know, we've had the motor car and the petrol engine for more than 100 years, almost 130 years now. Why is the petrol engine not getting 100 miles to the gallon? That's my question. Why is the petrol engine not getting 100 miles to the gallon? I just, I don't understand this. And now we're investing in infrastructures for electric vehicles. We're building two infrastructures so now we've got a fuel station on every corner and now we've got these charging stations for electric vehicles not to mention the cost of electric vehicles the cost to manufacture them shipping parts all over the world and what are we doing with the batteries after they become obsolete and i've talked to people that have had electric vehicles and i don't know if there's any smart drivers here now who have an electric vehicle or have driven an electric vehicle or have experience with one but my kid's mom had a Tesla and it wouldn't go an hour and a half up the road without needing a full recharge to come back. So they're, I don't think they're the great panacea that they think it's going to be for reducing the carbon footprint that we have with motor vehicles and transportation. If we want to reduce the carbon footprint because of vehicles, we need to invest in getting better fuel economy with the petrol engines that we have. We have the technology. There is absolutely no reason 
why these vehicles cannot get 100 miles to the gallon. And I would really love to hear smart drivers' thoughts on this, what they think of the electric car, how it's going to reduce the carbon footprint, you know, and whether we can get better fuel economy with petrol engines. Because, the, I mean, the other piece about this is electricity is not free. It, it's not completely environmentally safe. Uh, you know, they say, oh, you know, it's generated from water. Yes, the hydroelectric dams are generating electricity, turning turbines from water, but you have to build that dam. Hundreds and hundreds of acres of water of land need to be flooded to create a lake behind the dam. And then we need to run power lines. <laughs> we got to create all of these lines and infrastructure to plug our electric cars in. So how is that going to work? How is that going to be better? And how is that going to reduce our carbon footprint? Leave us a comment here. If you're listening on the podcast, leave a comment as well. And uh, we'll definitely get back to you and, and add all of that into the discussion about electric cars and reducing our carbon footprint because of transportation. Uh, presto, we don't even have the power grid to handle everyone having e electric vehicles. And that is true. Uh, ben, no electric vehicles for me, Rick. I'll stay uh, to gas or diesel. Uh, bricks for wheels in one example given in Saskatchewan handbook has 40 kilometers an hour as the speed limit interesting and uh, if you're talking about residential speed limits being 40 kilometers an hour they have done this in Alberta in Calgary that all residential roads went to 40 kilometers an hour 25 miles per hour it's the same thing as it was in the state of New York in the city of New York in New York City rather 25 mile an hour speed limit. So it sounds like they're doing the same thing in Saskatchewan and they're doing the same thing in Alberta as well that we're now reducing speed limits. And here's another piece of that is, is that the insurance agency in the states that's responsible for crash testing vehicles is now talking about pedestrian safety. And what they're saying is, is that we're going to reduce speed limits. Uh, we're going to put in automated enforcement. So that means stoplight cameras, red light cameras, these types of things and the all of the solutions that they're putting forward as a possibility to reduce deaths amongst pedestrians none of it brings into the equation the pedestrians pedestrians being arrogant pedestrians stepping out into the street pedestrians thinking that cars are going to stop for them when in many instances cars simply don't see the pedestrian and then they step out in front of them and they get hit so if you're going to put forth a solution to reduce pedestrian deaths and you're going to reduce speed limits in residential areas to 40 kilometers an hour or 25 miles an hour to try and shore up safety amongst pedestrians, you've got to have the other side of the equation. You have to bring pedestrians into the equation. You have to educate pedestrians that they make up 25% of traffic fatalities in North America, Europe, and other industrialized countries. And globally, that pedestrians make up 50%, half of traffic deaths. So we need to start to educate pedestrians. And this is a battle that's been going on with pedestrians and motor cars for more than 120 years when the motor car first came out. So we need to look at all of that. And before we start, you know, carte blanche, lowering speed limits to protect pedestrians along the roadway. Uh, you know, because I don't, I don't think it's working. I don't, I really don't think it is. Uh, Joe, looking forward to hearing about your experiment in Spain, Rick, uh, comparing them with us in Germany a dozen years ago. I noticed that drivers there seem to be a bit more, I don't know, disciplined. <laughs> It'll, it will be. I'm very much looking forward to it as well, Joe, and we'll see what happens. Uh, Peachy, the best way to reduce carbon is for large corporations to do their part. Excellent. Uh, Stefan, hi Rick. Uh, here in Phoenix, temperature in summer is high, and I'm using AC a lot. Is that affect? Does that affect fuel economy? And what is your advice, uh, Stefan? Yeah, two things, and that's an excellent point with air conditioning in a vehicle. So there's two things that you can do. Uh, if you're driving around slow, uh, then you can roll down your windows if that's even possible. Because I mean, uh, you're in Phoenix, and it is incredibly hot. And you're, it's pretty tough to not be in a vehicle when it's 100 degrees and not have your air conditioning on. Yes, it's, it's going to reduce the fuel economy on your vehicle. Now, going up and down the highway, it's better if you have the windows rolled up and the air conditioning on. It's, it's one of those things that you just can't get around that you're going to use more fuel when you have your air conditioning on in your vehicle because it takes some horsepower to run that air conditioning pump. 
but you're living in Phoenix when the temperature outside is 100 degrees Fahrenheit, you got to have the air conditioning on in the car, otherwise you're going to roast to death. Uh, I've had, <laughs> I've had the, the pleasure in, you know, in my lifetime of riding around in cars that didn't have air conditioning in 100 degree weather and they roll up the windows and they turn the fan on high and it does nothing to reduce the temperature inside the cabin of that car. So, you know, if you want, you, you have to, you just have to run the air conditioning. So, you know, but as we were talking about, you can do those other things where you can take alternative forms of transportation. You can put all your trips together. So you go out and you do your shopping at all the different shops and whatnot, uh, you know, and just try and reduce the number of trips that you're taking, the number of miles that you're doing and those types of things. You got You got to run the air conditioning, right? There are, there are some creature comforts that we're not willing to give up. And I think for me and for you as well, that that's probably one of those creature comforts that we're not willing to give up for sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, ben, I never in a hurry when I walk somewhere. Awesome. Uh, Mallory, just wondering if you can use cruise control too much on country roads. Uh, no, absolutely not. Uh, thanks, Sam, for that. Uh, Corey is an example, looks like in the city town decision in Saskatchewan, what the school's speed limit is, watch for the signs. Yes, and again, watch for the signs for sure. Uh, Epic says in New York City, 25 mile an hour speed limit is part of their Vision Zero program for your friend uh, Mac. It's always on local news, a Vision Zero ad. Some places have uh, fuel efficient parking slots. Uh, interesting, what is a fuel efficient parking slot? <laughs> uh, excellent. Uh, ben says we have cameras everywhere in Bloomington, Minnesota. Yes, uh, Dustin going 75 miles an hour. My Park Avenue mile per hour dropped by five miles an hour from 65 miles an hour. Uh, yes, and once you get up over 60 miles an hour, that too is going to affect your fuel economy because you're pushing more headwind. There's more resistance going up and down the road. So 60 is 60 miles an hour, 100 kilometers an hour is your optimum speed for getting the best fuel economy when you're going up and down the highway on cruise control. All right. Uh, Z, hi Rick, can turn off car and turn air conditioning on while car parking lot? Uh, no, you can't, Z. The engine has to be running for the air conditioning to be working. Uh, so, you know, if you're sitting in a parking lot, sitting in the car, maybe you might want to think about going to a coffee shop or a restaurant. You can sit in there and use their air conditioning uh, rather than using fuel to run your car sitting in a parking lot. Uh, presto gotta go now it was great hanging out and have a great night uh, presto you're most welcome have a great night my friend all the best uh, ben it's hot in cars uh, in the filters 50s my dad had a 49 ford pickup truck they didn't have ac in those vehicles yes uh, those vehicles that didn't have air conditioning it was called two 260 air conditioning uh, two windows down and 60 miles an hour. That was your air conditioning. So it was called air conditioning. The air conditioning was 260 air conditioning. Two windows down doing 60 miles an hour down the highway. That was your air conditioning. <laughs> yes, the good old days. Uh, ben, but what about using cruise control at 60 miles an hour on the freeway? Uh, ben, absolutely. Yes, you want to use cruise control when you're going up and down the highway at 60 miles an hour. So learn how to use it it's gonna you're gonna get fuel better fuel economy on your vehicle and that was the reason on the Volkswagen that we got 5.5 liters per hundred which is uh, 42 miles per gallon going from uh, it was a six hour drive from here to Calgary and the reason was because the whole time that I drove there I drove there at 110 kilometers an hour which is 65 miles an hour 68 miles an hour on cruise control and it still got 42 miles per gallon uh you know averaged it averaged about 39 40 miles per gallon both ways uh there and back and uh just you know great car so i would really encourage you if you're thinking about getting a new vehicle because your vehicle isn't getting that good of fuel economy uh and you're getting uh you're not getting the fuel economy that you want in your vehicle you want a newer vehicle then consider getting a smaller four cylinder engine a 1.8 liter engine with a turbocharger on it you have both the power and you've got the great fuel economy uh on the vehicle and you get the best of both worlds and you know it's going to save you some money uh peachy i once was low on fuel and stuck some ways from a gas station on a trip in the summer i turned off the air conditioning and drove slower to try and make it there it looked like i went swimming by the time i made it <laughs> yes i can imagine 
uh, Peachy, how much you were sweating when you turned off the air conditioning. Uh, because, man, those cars get really hot. And I'll, I'll tell you a funny story about that. The, the first summer that I ended up in Texas, I was uh, near San Antonio and I pulled into a truck stop in the middle of the afternoon. It was about two o'clock in the afternoon. I rolled into the truck stop and I saw like 50 trucks there. And I was like, why are all those trucks running? This makes no sense. It's the middle of summer. Why would the trucks be running? And so I get in the parking lot, I get parked, turn the truck off and I decide I'm gonna have a sleep. And so I climb in the sleeper and with the engine off and I was in the sleeper about 20 minutes and I woke up and I was just like absolutely drenched in sweat. And I was like, oh, that's why the truck's running because the air conditioning, because basically the cab of a, of a road tractor is, it's just a steel box with the sun, you know, the Texas sun hitting it in the middle of the afternoon. <laughs> I was just drenched. And I was like, oh, that's why their trucks are running, because of the air conditioning. So, yes, the inside of a car, the inside of a big truck, they're, you're just going to be absolutely drenched in the summertime if you don't have the air conditioning running. So, you know, you're going to use more fuel, and you, you just, it's, not, it's almost uncomfortable. Uh, it's almost impossible to sit in these vehicles. So when people say, oh, the good old days, you know, the 60s and the 70s when we didn't have air conditioning in vehicles. They weren't the good old days, right? Just watch Shawshank Redemption uh, at the end of the movie when he gets on the bus and he's going to Texas and he's got the window down, right? I mean, imagine 50 people on a bus without air conditioning for two hours of driving. How just melodious that would smell. Uh, I don't think melodious is there. Arom aromas, aromious, some some word. You know how bad it would smell after a couple of hours of fifty people sweating in the, in the bus. <laughs> oh my god, it would be terrible. Uh, I had some of the old timers when I was driving bus uh, telling me that they drove bus in the days that people smoked, and you know fifty people on a bus all you know smoking away on the bus. <laughs> And he said at the end of the, the end of the shift, he said it was just like it was just horrendous uh, the smell inside the buses with you know people smoking. And I mean we used to smoke on airplanes as well. Just crazy, crazy things that we used to do. Uh, Epic. When it comes to fuel economy, Canadians will use liters per hundred with Imperial miles per gallon uh, is one point time two times bigger than a U.S. Uh, mile per gallon, which is smaller and seen on U.S. car fuel economy stickers other than miles per gallon for electrics. Uh, thank you for that epic. Uh, Max says, I hear UPS trucks have no AC. How is that even possible that a UPS truck doesn't have AC? Especially those in California, Southern California, Arizona, Texas, Florida. I was in the Glades in Florida in the summertime and I stopped there about three o'clock in the morning and muggy and hot, like a hundred, hundred degrees Fahrenheit and 90% humidity in the glades in Florida. And it was just like, oh my God. You could, even with the air conditioning on, it was still too muggy to sleep. Uh, ben, I don't remember the Heartland show. No, I don't. Uh, Ruder, the amount of energy needed to go faster increases exponentially with speed. Generally, lower speeds will yield better fuel economy. Yes, absolutely. And you need that balance between, you know, how fast do we want to go and what's the fuel economy. And usually for me, that's about 60 miles an hour. That's, that's my nice balance between those two things. Uh, Robert, it's really difficult to use cruise control on the highway when you live in congested areas like major cities. There's just too much traffic and too much going on around you. And Robert, yes, if you're in New York City, then it's going to be a bit more challenging to use cruise control for sure. But there are some times that, yes, you can use it. Uh, but no, you're right. When there's a lot of congestion, a lot of traffic, then it's just tough to use cruise control. You're absolutely right. Uh, Joe, great live stream again this week. Lots of extremely helpful info. Have a fabulous week. All buenos nachos and hasta la, vez, hasta la vista in Spain, Rick. Thank you so much, Joe. All the best, my friend. Have a great night. Uh, Sam says, I lived in Florida for a short while and couldn't stand the humidity. <laughs> yes. And I had a friend who lived in Darwin uh, when I was in Australia, and he said six months was the length of time that he stayed there because even in the middle of winter, it was 36 degrees Celsius and 90% humidity. 36 is about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. He said it was just too hot 
So, <laughs> so we'll leave it there for tonight. Thank you so much. Uh, check out Pastor your driver's test first time over the Smart Drive Test website. It's on sale. And if you passed your driver's test in the last couple of weeks, good luck on that. Or congratulations on passing your driver's test in the last couple of weeks. If you have a test coming up in the next few weeks, good luck on that. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now. Yeah, honey.